If you or someone you know is experiencing a mental health crisis here around Wichita, call ComCare's 24-hour crisis line at 316-660-7500. If you think you or a loved one may be having thoughts of suicide or self-harm, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is a national network of local crisis centers that provides free and confidential emotional support to people in suicidal crisis or emotional distress 24 hours a day, seven days a week in the United States. Welcome to Read, Return, Repeat, a Read ICT podcast, where your host, I'm Daniel Pee Wardy. And I'm Sarah Dixon. We're both librarians at the Advanced Learning Library. In today's episode titled, Checked Out, we're going to jump ahead to Category 11 to explore the topic of mental illness and one man's experience living with bipolar disorder. Zach McDermott, originally from Wichita, is the author of Gorilla and the Bird, a memoir of madness and a mother's love. In the book, he recounts the psychotic break that led to his bipolar one diagnosis and the love and support of his mother that allowed him to learn to live with it. Okay. Hey, Zach. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're excited to get into it. Yeah, it's nice to meet you. For those who haven't read the book, can you tell our listeners about it? Okay, so Gorilla and the Bird, a memoir of madness and a mother's love. Um, Pretty accurate subtitle, I think. Um, So when I was 26, I was living in New York. I just moved here after law school in Virginia. Um, I was doing stand-up comedy at night, and I was making a living as a public defender during the day, uh, kind of burning the candle at both ends. Um... Comedy picked up pretty quickly. I actually did find myself in some chats to maybe have a TV show um, that I would write and star in. Um, I made friends with this guy who was the brother of a pretty big celebrity who actually died, but he had loads of connections from this, loads of money, and he became my partner and we were very good friends. Toward the end of my first year, I had the first of what would be several psychotic breaks. I was running around New York City, convinced that I was being videotaped, Truman Show style, that Jim Carrey movie where he's a character in a TV show, but only he doesn't know it. All his friends are fake and actors. Um, I thought that my producer, my friend, had set this up because I was not an actor. So he thought maybe if we kind of taped me in the wild through like hidden cameras and things like that, that I would be a more natural actor. Yes, none of this makes sense. I was experiencing a psychotic break. I ran through the streets of New York for 10, 12 hours, uh, broke up a rec league soccer game, ran through the game, exposing my buttocks, uh, just mooning the whole crowd. Um, Everyone screamed for me to leave. When started a rap battle with a group of black guys on the corner, ended up on a subway with my shirt off, my shoes off, wearing only soccer shorts in late October. It's freezing. Um, I get off the train, and I think all the pedestrians are basically doubling as production assistants. So, like, I'm supposed to follow the crowd basically scene to scene. We get off, half the people go left, half the people go right. I don't know who to follow. Um, I'm exhausted. I'm confused. I start crying. Two NYPD officers come up. They ask me, what's the problem? Um, I tell them, I think the problem is I'm cold and I'm trying to figure it out. Uh, This guy says, you got no shirt on, no shoes, and you're sitting here crying. You don't think that's a problem? I was like, "Uh, I don't know. So they're like, you don't seem violent. I was like, I'm completely nonviolent. And they said, well, you don't mind if we cuff you then for safety purposes. I said, no, but you're not real cops, right? And the guy said, no, there's a costume party later. So this reaffirmed that, yes, we are in a TV show. They cuff me. Instead of a squad car, they put me in the back of an ambulance. They take me to the notorious Bellevue psych ward, where I stay for the next 10 days, mostly still convinced I'm on a TV show. 
my mom shows up at first. I don't even think it's her. I think it's an actor in prosthetics. She got a call from the NYPD or she's in Wichita where I'm from. She flies out to New York. She's there for every minute of every visiting opportunity. Um, and it's not till she uses my name, Gorilla, she's the bird, that I believe it's her. So we talk. I'm still trying to convince her it's a TV show. I tell her she's a terrible actor. And she's, you know, there five minutes, 10 minutes before every visiting opportunity stays until they kick her out. Um, I had to go back to Wichita after I was discharged. I stayed with her for three months, just mostly smoking and drinking in her garage and trying to just process what happened and my new reality. Can I be a comedian? Can I be a lawyer again? What does bipolar disorder mean? Um, which is what I was diagnosed with. And this was not really my first rodeo. My uncle who's dead now was a paranoid schizophrenic. I have a lot of mental illness in my family. Um, and I represent mentally ill people as a public defender for a living. And I've sent a lot of people to Bellevue. So I left with an appreciation for the place that, you know, I never wanted to be, but did have to send people sometimes. Um, and there's a lot of Wichita in there, some stand-up comedy, the, maybe a little love story, and uh, it works out or it doesn't, but I'm alive. So that's, uh, that's, that's a long version of the back of the book. I maybe should have just read that, but that's, that, <laughs> that's what happened. Thank you. I mean, that, you. It's, yeah. it's a, it was a, a lot to share with um, your readers. So, so the readers of the book not only read your story, but also your mom's. How has the success of your memoir affected her? How did she react when you told her you were writing a memoir that she would be co-starring? She's my number one fan. She loves it. She loves, you know, if I need a confidence boost, I'll send her whatever I'm working on. It's always brilliant. Um, She's a writer herself. She loves writing. She was an English major. So I don't think I could have done anything that would make her more proud than getting a book published. And she loves that it's about her. She's not shy. She's a teacher. She speaks a lot. We speak at mental health, um, uh, what you call them, functions together frequently. Um, she's funny. And I mean, she's the hero of the book. So like, what do you want? You know, your son is lionizing you. I think she's, she's cool with it. So she definitely is the hero. Yeah. Uh, she seems like a really cool person. So. She's hard to write because she is really such a good person that I didn't want it to seem like, oh, I love my mommy. My mommy's so great. Um, and, There's you know, nothing wrong with that, yeah. is there? <laughs> no, That's but I'm. Um, kind of boring and then like okay great your mom's great we get it um but you know she she is so it was challenging it was like honestly challenging to make her believable because the woman is nearly saintly i mean she embodies unconditional love for a lot of people um and people that society writes off you know gang members things like that like we grew up around a lot of gang members because our house was just open to anyone she feed people, tutor people. And, you know, we have guys coming over that are struggling to read on a third grade level that are out getting shot, getting arrested. Some went to prison, you know, and some got college scholarships because of her. A couple did both. Um, and, you know, we got a guy that we were very close to, named Bobby, and he went to prison for seven years for a pretty heinous crime. But, um, you know, he's still family and he showed up uh, at our place as soon as he got out you know he calls my mom mom and she's just a very non-judgmental empathetic person that's good at loving people not even in spite of their flaws but almost because of them um and you know she's got there's a line in the book like the bird's got some flaws in her feathers and and one is kind of her choice of romantic partner um my dad no one would really nominate him for dad of the year he left when i was very young um I don't really have much of a relationship with him. My stepdad was, you know, you could probably say verbally, emotionally abusive, was definitely like very authoritarian. And it was just eight years of locking horns with him. Things got to where they never got violent, but he like kind of, you know, wanted it to. Uh, told my mom he'd love to take me outside and beat my, you know. Um, she's like, you know, you lay hands on him, I will 
have you arrested, but first I will stitch you into the bed and beat you with some pots and pans. And <laughs> then we left the next day. Um, but she has a lot of guilt, I think, about like kind of the male figures that she quote, put into our life. But for me, you know, when she married my stepdad, I was seven or eight, which would make my mom 31. Um, and I was the middle child. So she had a five-year-old, an eight-year-old, an 11-year-old. She was broke. Um, you know, we needed some, I'm not saying she married him for money. He didn't really have much. He was very middle class. But it put us squarely in the middle class. And also, I think, you know, she just wanted her boys to have a father figure. Um, and it's interesting, you know, I don't want to get too deep into like the psychoanalysts of it, but like I was thinking about this the other day and I was like, you know, I think the therapist might say that I've kind of been abandoned twice, like by father figures. Cause you know, after we moved out, he like never spoke to me again. He made an effort to have a relationship with my brother, but not me. And I never cared because I didn't like the guy and he didn't like me. And I was just happy he, he was gone. But I was just thinking about, I was like, you know, back of the mind, like, you know, that, that probably left a mark of some sort, but I, I think just on balance, it was so much better that, you know, I, I was happy with it, but yeah, you know, I think it, it, it probably could have even been worse than it was. And thankfully she left when she did, but yeah, she has guilt about how she manages her finances too, which like, you know, I tell her like, look, we were broke. What are you, what are you going to do? There's nothing to manage, you know, you're managing groceries. So, um, but yeah, she's very cool. Very funny. Very smart. Very sweet. Well, your feelings on her are very clear in your book. Now in, um, reading it, cause Daniel and I both read it. Um, you're not very nice to your hometown of Wichita, which Daniel and I both call home. Um, yeah. There's contempt for sure, but there's still like this underlying sense of attachment. Yeah. Um, how has your relationship to Wichita changed following the publication of this book? And uh, relatedly, how did your local like family, friends, acquaintances, the people from here um, respond to your more scathing assessments? So the city itself, I, I, I really, I love Wichita. I do. And I do call it home and I come back whenever I can. I think, you know, I didn't have too many people from Wichita say I missed the mark. Uh, a lot of people are like, yeah, <laughs> I know this place. And, you know, Wichita has got a lot of problems. There's a lot to like, there's a lot that's problematic. And then there's a lot that's just like, you know, I wish we had more vegan options, you know, things like this, just, yeah. you know what I mean? Like just kind of culture and food and things like that, that like, you know, yeah, I, I love all that New York has to offer, but you know, I find Wichita amusing. Um, I think you can read the book and say, yeah, you're harsh on the town. And I would say like, okay, maybe, but this was my experience. Um, I think anyone that lives there does have positive and negative things to say about it. I think a lot of the negative stuff I highlighted is kind of funny. Um, and it's, you know, like it, it was a hard place to grow up in a lot of ways. Like I got in a lot of fights growing up and I think it was, you know, there's this culture of like toxic cowboy masculinity and, you know, there's like, we all know there's fights in Wichita, whether you get in one or not, it's not, it's not an easy place. And, you know, I was an athlete. I went to a lot of parties and, you know, people come, they drink, they get tough, testosterone gets going. And before you know, people are knuckling up, knuckling up. And I was beat up very badly a few times. Um, it's no secret that there's a, a lot of, you know, racism and Trumpism in Wichita, which I'm, you know, that's the opposite of what I'm about. So like, yeah, I mean, there's stuff that makes me angry about it. There's stuff I can't stand. There's a lot of people I don't want to associate with, but beautiful sunsets, you know, it's a very easy place to live. It's cheaper than hell. Um, get anywhere. Cost in cost of living. Yeah. <laughs> for now, for for now. Now. <laughs> the rent's going a little bit up right now, but it's, it's, it's still pretty good. Yeah. yeah. My $2,200 apartment, it ain't much. Um, <laughs> But yeah, no, so that's the first part of the question. The second, friends and family, 
Um, definitely did not go over well with my dad's side of the family. Been semi disowned. Um, definitely not going to Christmas anytime soon. Might even really have to skip a funeral. Um, they all also carry guns, so I'm not really interested in any sort of confrontation. Um, and look, I get, especially my uncle, where they're coming from. Um, you know, it wasn't a flattering portrayal. That's not to say it lacked verisimilitude, but it wasn't flattering. I do think it was funny. Um, I do have people that have read the book have said, like, they were mad about that. That's nothing. And you can tell that you love them. And I do feel like, you know, it was revealing some of the like, you know, funny stuff. Like my family is funny um, unintentionally a lot of the time. But, um, you know, people are like you can tell you love them. You're just kind of telling it how it is. Um, and what's funny is my uncle, whose name was changed, called me up and just ripped into me, called me all sorts of stuff. And you know, the funny thing is he's not named in the book. And I'm just like, you know, if there's nothing true here, how do you like, where do you recognize yourself? You know, like, <laughs> how do you know this isn't just someone totally made up? So then he went on some website, wrote some horrible review of the book, said it reads like a cheap grade school paperback. And uh, then signed, so he logged in under his real Facebook account. So you know who it is. And then he signed <laughs> aim that I had assigned to him. So it was like, Literally, no one would know this is you. But now, I mean, I won't say everyone does. It's not like people are just like, well, let me find this obscure review of Gorilla and the Bird. Um, but yeah, so they're pretty salty. And we didn't really have a relationship to begin with. I'd see them once a year. So it's not like a big thing. But I actually did feel really bad. Felt like I was punching down. And like, I understood where they were hurt. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I I also stand by that chapter. I think it's pretty funny. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh man, that's not that's not people like you know the, the the people like that don't exist. And I was like, oh yeah, I do know people who. It's it also me of, there are several Wichita's mm -hmm. like there yeah. those people definitely exist, and so do gang members, and so do rich people, and so do Republicans, and so do liberals. Like it's it's a way more diverse city. Um, in ways other than race, but racially too, um, than people think, you know, people think when you out here, you think it's, you know, a cornfield. I'm like, we've got more shootings per capita than Compton some years. Like <laughs> it's, yeah. it's no, I do get nervous when I walk around. I feel like I don't necessarily like look dress necessarily like your typical Wichita, whatever that is. And I do feel like some eyes on me, um, like, from some of these good old boys with who like just walk around with guns on their hips. And I think it's like, honestly, you know, I, I've got a very dark beard. I think there's maybe some like this guy, uh, one of them Muslim sort of things going on. Um, and like, I, I feel that and I don't really see where else it's coming from. That's kind of like where I suspect it lies from just the, the nature of, you know, what the people with, that are giving me eyes look like. So, yeah, I mean, I, like, I, I get a little nervous there, too. I feel like people are a little too aggressive and violent. And, you know, I talk to my grandma who lives there every day, and she's always telling me about some new shooting. Like, happens way more often than in New York. So, yeah, it's a complicated place, but definitely interesting. I think it's like bubbles, because I, like, will wear a lot of metal shirts. And I can definitely know I'm not in my downtown bubble when I'm getting looks. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm, like, I'm like, oh, I'm wearing a metal shirt at K96 and Greenwich. Oh, I forgot. Well, I also like, so I have a bad back and I was flying a lot when the book came out and I will stand up for like the good majority of the flight and I'll like walk back and forth and no one ever cares where I'm going anywhere. But when I'm on the little puddle jumper transferring for in Dallas to go to Wichita and I get up and I'm like walking toward the cockpit and back, I swear to God, I see people looking at me like, is it time to say let's roll and tackle this guy? <laughs> Especially because I'm always stretching. So I think most people are probably listening to this. So I'll describe what I'm doing, but make kind of a U goalpost thing with my hands to like stretch out the thoracic. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think it looks like I'm having kind of a little like, you know, prayer maybe beforehand. And like, I, I, I mean, I've, I've, 
I don't think it's unprojected. Like I, I see us in people's faces and it's kind of crazy, but um, yeah, it feels like going into another dimension when you leave the East village and go to Wichita, but it's, it's fun. I, I don't think I'd, you know, really want to live there, but I, I definitely enjoy visiting and my mom's still there. So. Yeah. So Sorry, getting- you offer a great detail of your manic episodes, including some things I'm sure you'd rather not share with the whole world or that you wouldn't want your grandmother to read. Why share those things? Um, I, I did want the whole world to read it. I want more people to read it. Um, I, you know, part of it comes probably from whatever disposition it is that makes a person willing to do stand up comedy. Um, makes a person write a memoir um you know if you're not really willing to like give us the straight scoop and you know be vulnerable like i don't really want to read that um this for me i'm a writer first and you know a guy that lives with mental illness second um and I'm all about like, what's, what makes the better story, you know, like while well, staying true to the facts, but like, it doesn't really matter how I feel. It matters like how you write the best book and you get one first book and you need to make it as good as possible. So that was my concern. It also takes years to write this stuff. Um, I had written an S so you're kind of reckoning with that, you know, and you know, it's coming a little bit. I also wrote an essay for Gawker, um, they got like a hundred thousand hits and I was still a lawyer at the time and it was pretty revealing and vulnerable. And, you know, it was a little nervy going to work the next day. Um, but I mean, really this experience in this book, like helped me realize a lot of dreams. And I think it's important that if you're able to do that without too much embarrassment that, you know, you tell those stories because, you know, people need to know, like, I'm not alone. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. This is an illness. I also just, I don't care, you know, if you're going to judge me for, for whatever, for going crazy and doing crazy things while I was crazy, then, you know, you don't get it. And that's, that's on you. Um, my grandma loves the book. She's read it a few times. Um, yeah, there's probably some stuff I wouldn't want to read aloud next to her, but um, I think it was a good experience for her to read it too. I think she understood me way better. What's going on with me. I probably shed some light on her own son who is featured in the prologue. Um, I did read that to her, uh, on Memorial day at his grave actually, and got a little weepy. Um, but yeah, no, they, they, she loves the book and I'm, I'm just, I don't have a, a very high shame factor, I guess, threshold. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that's what you want to read, right? You want the warts, not the like, oh, you know, work was great today. Who cares? <laughs> well, and I kind of, I, the way that I took it as your reader was just like lifting the veil on um, some of that stuff that we probably try to keep hidden. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like it's important for us to read that. Like I've never experienced anything like that. And so in order to um, understand what more people are going through and you know. It kind of goes into the whole like when you talk about like polite society and like I forgot what word you use when you're in New York and you kind of have to ignore seeing crises just to get through your day because like yeah. you have to put blinders on and people need just, like, bl- go ahead. need blindness I think or something like that maybe yeah. is what I said. yeah yeah you have to you you'll never get to brunch if you stop to help everybody on the way you know you just won't. Um, I see homeless people on the way to work. And then when I get to work, I represent homeless people and (laughs) it's everywhere. And it's very sad. Um, Definitely. You get some kind of like lingering secondary trauma, if you will, from being exposed to this all the time. But um, you know, you, you gotta have a certain stoicism um, to kind of like do this work effectively. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's terribly sad and New York's doing horrible things to the homeless right now. They're clearing out, you know, places where people sleep, you know, I mean, these are, these people are dwellingless, but 
where you lay your head is your home. And just because it's a tent and a shopping cart doesn't mean it's more valuable, you know, less valuable than my MacBook Air. It's way more valuable. I can get another one if mine goes on the fritz today, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it, it's crazy what, you know, this Democratic mayor, Eric Adams, is doing. Um, I, I can't believe, you know, the party of like Black Lives Matter couldn't do better than electing a like fairly authoritarian former police officer. But, you know, that's what we did. And so far, it's kind of, you know, not been great for criminal defense nor homeless people. Um, but, you know, that's another story. Different podcast. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, hey, um, we're going to take a. Oh, I'm so sorry. Zach rants about local politicians. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have that one next week. Yeah, sounds um, good. Well, we're going to take a quick break, um, but when we get back, we want we've got a couple more questions for you, including some questions about your foundation. Cool. Did you know that the Wichita Public Library offers a large selection of digital magazines for free? They are easy to access and are now available to you on the Libby app. You can download Libby from your phone or tablet's app store, sign in with your Wichita Public Library card, and start browsing immediately. Magazines can be found under the guide section on Libby and include popular magazine titles about news and politics, cooking, celebrity news, healthy living, and more. For additional information on Libby, please visit wichita.overdrive.com. Welcome back. In one of the interviews since publishing the book, you mentioned that it took you a number of years to write it and was something like 3,000 pages long originally. Obviously, a lot of the material was cut to get the book we know now as The Gorilla and the Bird. Do you have plans to write a second book with the discarded material? Are you working on anything else? Yeah, I'm, I'm writing a book right now. I have no idea what it's about. It's a sloppy novel. Um, hopefully... Yeah, hopefully kind of more of the same uh, to a certain extent. But um, there's also been, you know, I'm, I'm almost 40 right now. And uh, like, I think I've been just kind of meditating a lot on like, what, what's life? <laughs> um, and I keep coming to like some pretty cynical, nihilistic conclusions. It keeps coming down to like nothing matters. And the irony of like working really hard to articulate really well that nothing matters is not lost on me. <laughs> it's like, well, you're, you're working awful hard to, to tell us that, aren't you, bud? Um, but yeah, I kind of, you know, I'm like, what, what's productive? What's a life? What's, what's cool? What's happy? You know, when did you, what's making it sort of thing? Um, how do you deal with like, friendships receding and fading and all but ceasing to exist and you know like being being kind of lonely being single um you know all the stuff that you know these fragile little things we have that could probably break any of us down pretty good pretty quickly but that we kind of just march through life with our armor on pretending like we're not lonely and half depressed <laughs> um so yeah, kind of getting into that and I'm trying to not make it a huge buzzkill, but I'm like, eh, maybe I'm cynical. I don't know. <laughs> there are plenty yeah. of buzzkill books out there. So, you know, you just kind of have to follow your um, inspiration, I guess. I mean, I just, I write every day, more or less. I try to get a thousand words a day or more. And, you know, it's whatever is on my mind at the moment because I just, you know, what's beautiful about writing, I think once you're hitting your stride, like it's not too dissimilar from reading. Like, I don't know what's happening in three pages when I'm writing it. You know, sometimes you have a better idea than others, but it's a conversation. You know, you're going to sit there and go, what was I talking about again? Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm talking about this now. Um, and I find that like the, you know, the more experienced I get as a writer, like it, the, the part about like writing sentences and paragraphs that's not really hard for me anymore it's a thing I know how to do um but like what's interesting why you know what give me story 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 that's harder and you know with gorilla wasn't near that challenge because like he gets stuck it's like well what should happen next well what did happen next okay keep keep it moving keep it linear and keep it moving 
with this, although there's plenty based on real life and I don't have any clue what the book's about yet, really I'm doing a lot more lawyer stuff than the first book. Um, I just went back to work. So I'm practicing again. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know what it is. So I kind of just take what's coming. I'm struggling more to find the story than to write it, but I'm really feeling good. Um, feel like my chops are kind of back and like, you know, with, with me, if I write a thousand words in a day, it's a good day. And if I don't, it's not a good day. It's just, you know, it's kind of like a gym rat. They got to get that like dopamine hit and, you know, not dopamine. What, what do you, what do you get? I don't know what you get. You get a, I you get a, dopamine, but it's adrenaline. Yeah. Yeah. And then it causes, creates, I don't know. I'm not, Endor- Endorphins. Yeah. That there are right. t- yeah. All those things, all the good magical chemicals. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we can't wait to see it. Yeah. But you know, me, me, me. twenty twenty four probably. <laughs> That's right. a legit goal. <laughs> well, when it comes out, we'll have you here so you can see your um, adoring Wichita public. Love it. <laughs> um, now you started a foundation a few years ago called the Gorilla Bird Foundation to end uh-huh. the mental illness to prison pipeline. Um, mm-hmm. The compassion you feel for this area is very, very clearly um, described in your book. Can you tell us more about this organization and the work that you're doing? Yeah, we haven't been as active as I want us to be. We've raised some money. We've spent a lot of it. Um, I was able, once we got access to our our money last year, I handed out, I don't know, five or so grants ranging from like a thousand to a few thousand dollars just to people that have been touched by mental illness um, and are working artistically in some capacity to combat that. Um, we want to make this a whole huge thing, but um, you know, the we had a, another project that was going to be a film shot in a prison. Um, we were going to be doing a lot of work with inmates that got shelved because of COVID. Um, and I just honestly need need more help with that right now, but it's something I hope to like kind of become, you know, a huge part of my, my workload. Um, but yeah, I, you know, if you know any good fundraisers out there, have them hit me up, we could use some help right now, but yeah, we've got a little money still and we've got a vision. We just, you know, like I said, COVID sidelined a lot and we're small right now. So need to raise money and spend money. That's basically a segue, but we do have nonprofit resources, uh, uh, NASCAR uh, Foundation Nonprofit Resources is a whole section in the library, and we have access to the foundation database for helping grant makers and stuff, and I help well, people work with that and stuff. So if you're in your town, well, stop by. Well, yeah, we might be talking about that. That sounds good. Yeah, we have a ton of resources. Good yeah. idea, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Not to plug our I service. Love our free resources. services. Yeah. You might lose, you might leave here with a new job. <laughs> You offer a lot of musical references in your book, almost like a soundtrack to your life. For those of us that grew up in the era, this really helped place the story. Was that intentional? Do you feel like music, especially hip hop, has helped you process your thoughts on your mental illness and other trauma? I love music. I listen to a ton of hip hop. I do like kind of write to a soundtrack a little bit, not meaning I listen to music when I write, although I do that sometimes too. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I also tried to write this book, you know, to read like a TV or, or or show or movie. And, you know, I'm always kind of thinking like, well, you know, what's playing right now? It's interesting, the director that, so the book's been optioned to be an HBO series. Um, and the director was Jean-Marc Vallée, who did uh, Wild... He did Dallas Buyers Club, Big Little Lies, and Sharp Objects. Well, he passed away on Christmas of this year, just completely unexpectedly, had a heart attack. Um, And I knew him. Um, He was a great guy, extremely talented. I wouldn't have anyone, if like literally if I could pick any director in the world, I would pick him to direct my thing. But he loves music, and he does this thing. I don't remember the technical term in TV writing, but he has music almost all the time in his shows, but like it only ever comes from a natural source. So like someone's listening to the music, it's either elevator or headphones or speaker. It's never just montage, you know, music. Um, 
and it's diegetic. Diegetic no. and non-diegetic. Diegetic it takes place in the story, non-diegetic. So. Look at you. And you and you <laughs> thousand percent right, and no one knows if you're wrong. <laughs> but no, so he the way he starts a project is he makes a Spotify playlist and they like sent me, they were like, will you make a playlist for this? So I made it, sent it to him and sent it to Brian Seip, who's the showrunner and writer of the series. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's obviously like not a thing that's unique to me when you're like kind of putting a piece together, like, okay, well, what's this sound like? Um, why so hip hop heavy? I mean, that's what I listen to. I listen to everything, but you know, Spotify just, knows I want the Wu-Tang Clan and that's what they queue up for me when I when I queue I'm like give me some new stuff they're like no you you like the 90s and you like rap so that's what you'll be listening to um did hip-hop help me process it probably I mean I, I find a lot of truth in that music I relate to it um you know I like I just I love it um and there is kind of a you know there's an ethos of like I am who I am it kind of runs through that um, with some hubris slapped on top of that usually. But uh, yeah, you know, there's something in there about kind of being unapologetically yourself that I probably identify with and also an anti-authoritarian uh, sort of disposition. And, you know, anyone who reads my book will know I'm not a huge fan of law enforcement. Um so there's that too. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I, I love the stuff. And I think a lot of the book like goes well with that. Um, but yeah, you know, there's some rock in there too. Granny's iron into the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and Pink Floyd. So yeah. I thought that was a really sweet, like scene in your book when you're talking about how she listens to the music of her son uh, to like connect with him and i thought that was i really enjoyed that part too well she just loves it on her own now that that was her exposure you know, he was always playing that stuff like super loud and she got into it so yeah she's 91 and listens to the stones every day <laughs> that's awesome yeah um if you feel comfortable talking about it uh, mm -hmm. How did the isolate? Well, obviously, you feel comfortable talking about a lot of things. Um, how did the isolation that many of us experienced throughout the pandemic affect your illness? So this is just so much. Um, I'm gonna have to just absolutely give you like three bullet points. But after being pretty episode free, save a little uh, a little incident in 2018. But other than that, I hadn't been hospitalized. I wasn't hospitalized for that, but I hadn't been hospitalized since 2012. Um, I don't know why, and I don't know what, if anything, COVID had to do with it. But in 2020, I went to the hospital more times than, like, I, I really don't even know how many times. It was at least five. And I was kind of in and out of psychosis all year i ended up in a situation where i had some squatters living with me um it was the worst year of my life covid aside like just you know i was in and out of the hospital and um yeah it's just kind of like low-grade psychosis for almost a calendar year um it was very scary for everybody um I don't want to write Gorilla again, but there is a book's worth of stuff in there. Um, I'm going to pull out what I can. It's kind of a little painful to revisit it. I'm not really like ready to read all the texts and emails from friends and family yet. Um, not really ready to like interview people and because it becomes like a laundry list of embarrassing and sometimes harmful things you did. and even though my friends and family aren't trying to like give me a guilt trip or take me to task, you can only hear like you did this then that then this so many times for so long before you're like, okay, I just break, you know, I get it. I know it's, there's no limit to how many embarrassing stories there are here. Um, and they're just, and they're painful. I also got, beat up really badly. I just got jumped in Brooklyn one night. Um, don't even know who it was. No words were exchanged. I just turned a corner, just got popped and dropped and then just beat. Like I literally thought I was about to die. I had a really bad concussion. 
I was in so much pain. I was like waking up and going to sleep in tears every day. I'd be like so out of it. I didn't know what room of my apartment I was in. So I'm dealing with like the psychotic break, getting my bell rung, thinking I maybe had some permanent brain damage. Thank God I don't, didn't. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a, a horrible year overall. And people are often like, oh, that was COVID. It's like, no, it wasn't though. <laughs> that wasn't your COVID. You didn't go to the hospital five times. It's not normal. Um, but yeah, so awful. And I could say more. <laughs> Yikes. I'm sorry. It's all right. I'm, I've been there before. So yeah. Yeah. Glad you're here with us today. Me too. Me too. Um, yeah, no, it was, it was wild. (laughs) Yeah. Do you have any words of advice for our listeners who may be living with a mental illness themselves or have a close loved one who may be struggling? Yeah. You know, my mom's got a pretty good saying and she says like when people are at their worst, when you're repelled by them and you want to run away, what you really need to do is, is go forward and meet them and she's very good at saying like you need to meet people where they are and you know there was times where she would come to the hospital where I was just like acting like a child and we would talk about Disney movies and we would like name Disney movies and I would get mad if she named a live action instead of a an animated movie and you know she's talking to her son who you know went to a top 10 law school and is you know practicing law in New York and you know, normally doesn't talk about Disney movies too frequently. And that was the level of discourse I was capable of having. Um, but I mean, yeah, so that's an example of meeting somebody where they are and, you know, being aware that you can't really talk someone out of a psychotic break. You kind of have to be patient. You need to figure out what they think is going on. I would be very reluctant to get authorities or a hospital involved because psych wards are, are a nightmare. Um, and there unfortunately isn't really a middle ground between doing nothing and that, like, there's not a lot of like, you know, minor emergency for psych, you know, it's like kind of the whole thing. We lock you up or you're out. Um, you know, if it's someone that's been diagnosed and is compliant with meds and stuff, you can nudge them to take their meds. Um, that we're not always receptive to that. I'm very good about taking mine unless I'm sick, in which case sometimes I think like, oh, I don't need a, an antipsychotic right now, which is literally the only time I need one. <laughs> but, you know, your judgment can get a little blurry. So, you know, you, you can't take anything personal. Um, you can't get mad. You just got to have compassion, try to figure out how you can help the person. And for certain people, no matter how close you are, and in fact, closeness could be like a barrier you might not be able to reach your best friend your sister whatever you know there might be some like brotherly issues some daughterly issues some you know for all the reasons we love people you know there's always um there's no like relationship that's without its baggage for lack of a more creative term and some of those things can really get exacerbated in in the throes of you know, an acute mental health crisis. So you kind of got to let whoever is having some success approaching the person, approach the person. And if you think you can give them space and have them be safe, you might have to do that too. Um, but you know, it's patience and, and love. And, uh, there's some good organizations too. NAMI is a good organization, National Alliance on Mental Illness. I do a lot of work with them. So they have some resources, but, you know, I talk all over the country about this stuff and it, it it's a thing that, it's tough when people are in it and it's, it's a thing that doesn't have a one size fits all solution at all. But, you know, I think it's important to recognize the, the symptoms, the earlier you get at something, the better chance you have of keeping it under control. And, you know, like when someone starts very first starts exhibiting symptoms, you say, Hey man, are you, what's your, what's your level right now? I have a friend who asked me how your bananas, that's what he says when he's, trying to <laughs> ask if I'm okay. And bananas are like when you're carrying around crazy stuff, you don't need to carry around. It's like, drop your bananas, gorilla. That's what he tells me. And, oh, I get yeah, it. 
Yeah. Sorry, I did not. I just was like, oh, bananas. Okay, potassium. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Kind of like the spoon thing they do. For, I've like heard that a lot for people with that are not uh, neuro, that are neurodivergent. Spoon analogies, like how many spoons do you have today, and things. Yeah, I, I think Sorry I, to interrupt. Yeah, he never asked me how feelings. Like, how, how's how's bananas right now? And you know, I tell him if I got one or two, and you know, normally I don't. That was what was so scared about last year. Scary about last year. I didn't really change my routine. I didn't go off my medication. I wasn't drinking more than I normally do. I wasn't smoking more than I normally do. Just kind of doing my thing. And um, I'm still kind of at a loss for what happened, but you know, I've been good for over a year now. So yeah, you know, this thing is uh people are kind of like, oh, you overcame this, you know, you wrote a book, you're doing fine. It's like, yes and no. It's more like diabetes than pneumonia. Like it's there, it's not going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations on on a year from since the last year. That's really good. Here. Yeah. Yeah. No. About a year and a half now. It's 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 good. I mean, it was definitely scary um, for for everybody for sure. Yeah, I was writing uh, just script for this uh, podcast, and it was like, no, you don't say that you overcame it because you're just learning to yeah. live with it. So there's yeah, it's, a distinction. It's maintenance, not you know conquering the thing it's 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 living with it but um you know i by and large i uh you know do all right with it and and, and mostly okay but you can't really hope to be much better than mostly okay i don't think <laughs> you know yeah right? yeah that's mostly yeah mostly okay and thank you better so than, much though oh go ahead uh, no i just gonna say better than mostly dead Princess. I was, I was going with that, but I yeah. just wasn't gonna. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for joining us. It was great talking to you, and uh, no, you guys reaching out and having me. It's been fun. Yeah. And the book was great, and I, I like the audio book too. So yeah, you did a oh, great job reading that. Thank you so much. That was an ordeal. Let me tell you, <laughs> we recorded half of it, and then I got better, so we had to record it uh, the first half all over again. <laughs> It was supposed to take four days. It took like three weeks, but I was just like, it was like, well, we got to do the first half over there. Like, I don't think we got to do it all over. I was like, was that better? They were like, yeah. I was like, what are we going to do? Tell people it gets really good around hour five. Like, no, we got to do it over. (laughs) So, yep. We did it over. Glad you liked it. Did you have any social media things that people could follow you on and keep, keep Uh, the progress of the the second book? But um, Wichita Zach with the CK is my Instagram handle. And then Twitter, I believe I'm just at Zach McDermott, again, with the CK, M-C-D-E-R-M-O-T-T. Uh, and yeah, I don't ever tweet and rarely post anything on Instagram, but people will message me on there. I look at it. Cool. Well, we'll put those in the show notes yeah. as well. So cool. cool. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us today. This was fantastic um, working with you and learning from you. Um, And to any listeners that haven't picked up your book yet, I hope that we've convinced them to do that. Do it. Thank you. (laughs) All right. Tell your your brother I said hi. Yeah, I will tell him you said hi. So cool. Great. Take care. Did you know you can check out more than just books and movies at your library? Over the past year, the Library of Things program has added many new and unique items for checkout. Need internet access? Check out a Wi-Fi hotspot, either on its own or bundled with a Chromebook. Keep your home safe with our radon detectors or explore the night with our telescopes. For the little ones, Steam to Go activity kits are available in a wide variety of interests such as fossils, robotics, and engineering. All this and more can be found at wichitalibrary.org things. And now here are some recommendations from Wichita Public Library staff for books that deal with mental illness, category 11. My name is Jenny Durham, and I'm an adult programming librarian at the Wichita Public Library. 
My recommendation for category 11 is In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. In this rather unconventional memoir, Machado recounts her horrifying experience with an abusive relationship with a woman from her past. Most of the story takes place in the house she shared with this woman, which she labels as the dream house. This house starts off as a place of idyllic refuge and a representation of all her hopes and wishes for a future together with this woman, but then it quickly becomes an ugly place that is like a prison she can't escape from. What I think is incredible about this book is the author's unique way of experimenting with the memoir genre. Machado melds her own personal anecdotes with reflections on society and how historically the reality of abusive relationships in the queer community have been ignored or minimized. The dream house which is central to this story is itself a character and is used as a literary device that mirrors the author's own mental health as she becomes increasingly trapped in this abusive relationship. This is an intense, difficult story and is brutally honest with the reality of just why so many people are unable to escape abusive relationships and how it literally changes how victims of abuse experience the world, both in the physical toll it takes on their bodies and the years of trauma that can take years to process afterwards if they are lucky enough to escape the relationship. I highly recommend trying this one out, but this book may also be upsetting to some readers, so please read with caution. This has been my recommendation for Category 11, a book that deals with mental illness. For more reading recommendations, please visit wichitalibrary.org slash readict. Hi, I'm Robin from the Wichita Public Library, and this is my recommendation for Category 11, a book that deals with mental illness. Jenny Lawson published her most recent work, Broken in the Best Possible Way, last year in 2021. Lawson suffers from both anxiety and depression and has made her mark as an author by pinning now four books on her life with these conditions in an incredibly unique way. In Broken, she approaches mental health in a humorous yet honest fashion, instead of sweeping it under the rug, as our society sometimes seems like it wants us to do. Broken posits that speaking of pain openly can be a huge part of community building, and that the world feels safer somehow if we share our pain. It becomes more manageable, and by sharing our pain, we inspire others to share theirs. We are so much less alone if we learn to wear our imperfections proudly, like tarnished jewelry that still shines just as brightly. As someone who suffers from anxiety and depression too, as well as ADHD, her willingness to dive deep into the battles she encounters with the U.S. mental health care system, her insurance company, and even her own brain, I find her dialogue incredibly refreshing and special. With her interview at the 2021 San Antonio Book Festival, she assures us that we are all carrying around our own challenges and our own monsters, but that sometimes we can learn to live with them and even cherish them. This has been my recommendation for Category 11. To find more and a curated list, go to wichitalibrary.org slash readict. Hi, I'm Ian, and I'm a member of the adult programming team at the Advanced Learning Library. For Read ICT Category 11, a book dealing with mental illness, my recommendation is the graphic novel Invisible Differences by Julie Drache. This autobiographical story follows Marguerite, a French woman in her late 20s who constantly feels overwhelmed with social interaction and struggles with the fear that she might not be like her friends and colleagues. Her lack of social skills strain her personal relationships, her sensitivity to noise disrupts her work, and she constantly feels like her world is chaotic and suffocating. When she finally reaches the breaking point, she begins to research autism spectrum disorders and begins the long process of obtaining a diagnosis. The book follows Marguerite over the course of several years, from her struggles with everyday life and the accompanying anxiety and distress, to her eventual diagnosis with Asperger's syndrome. At the time, autism and Asperger's were poorly understood by the French psychiatric community, let alone the average French person, and Marguerite made it her mission to educate and advocate for autism. I would recommend this book to anyone who wants to better understand autism and Asperger's or just feels like reading an inspiring story of a young woman finding strength among chaos.
This has been my recommendation for Category 11. For more reading recommendations, visit wichita.publiclibrary.org slash readict. Thank you again to Zach McDermott, author of Gorilla and the Bird, for sharing his story about mental illness and joining us today to further that discussion. And thank you to our staff for those terrific recommendations. To request any of the books heard about in today's episode, visit wichitalibrary.org or call us at 316-261-8500. To participate in the Read ICT Reading Challenge, visit wichitalibrary.org slash readict. Stay connected with other participants on the Read ICT Challenge Facebook page. You can find out what's trending near you, post book reviews, look for local and virtual events, and share book humor with like-minded folks. To join the group, search hashtag ReadICTChallenge on Facebook and click join. You can follow this podcast through the Anchor app or stream episodes on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on. If you like what you heard today, be sure to subscribe and share with all your friends. This has been a production of the Wichita Public Library, and a big thanks goes out to all the staff members that helped produce this episode. I'm Sarah Dixon. And I'm Daniel Pee Wardy. Join us next episode when we discuss Category 6, a book about mythology or folktales. And now we'll leave you with a short piece of prose submitted to our short story dispensers, Inspiration by Dylan Pilly. This is one of the many short stories and poems you can get from one of our short story dispensers located at Reverie Roasters Coffee Shop and now the Eisenhower Airport. And if you have a short story under 8,000 characters to submit, you can visit wichitalibrary.org slash short story. Inspiration by Dylan Pilly. I usually spend my time reading stories such as fiction, fantasy, action, etc., Sometimes I also made some stories that I have in my head. I made them based on what I fantasized, what I wanted to be and wanted to happen. I always had free time, but I did not go outside because I feared people. I feared that they might make fun and pick on me, the way I dress, the way I walk, and the details about me that even I don't know. Reading through stories while listening to music, holding a book in my hand, my phone in the desk, and earphones on my ear, I suddenly got a notification. A notification that may change my life or the way I view life. A notification that suddenly shook me from reading because I was too immersed into the story. I checked what it was, and there I saw an invitation to a convention an invitation to propose stories. And if your story is recognized, then you will be encouraged to do more stories and you will be recognized by pe people, by readers. It was very unimaginable that I would be invited because I only posted stories in a shady site. I thought it might have been a scam, but reading through what the notification might have been, I saw that it was a real invitation. I immediately accepted the invitation because I have dreamt of being a writer for the longest time I could remember. I thought of stories that I could have submitted for the readers, but none of them seemed good enough. I thought of stories that involved action or drama, but I thought that all of those wasn't good enough to be submitted. I felt frustrated. I felt that my dream may never come true. I couldn't understand why they were not good enough. I was running out of options. Then I came up with an idea. What if I looked around my room, my house, check every part of it and think of what history it may have. I looked around my room, under the desk, the closet, nothing. I looked around the house, the bathroom, the kitchen, the living room, the basement, all over the house, but I still couldn't get any idea of what story to write. I ran out of options. I don't know what to do. Then I came up with another idea, one that I never wanted to do, going outside my house. The idea I came up with was to see sceneries, to watch people in the park, the riverbank, the city. At first I hesitated, but I couldn't think of another way. So I went to the city, but I couldn't think of one. I saw people walk, talk to one another, and a homeless person singing to gain some spare change. I thought to myself that 
I might have been a lucky person and that I'm taking my current life for granted. I went to the next location immediately because I didn't want to sm spend my time outside too much. Next, I went to the park. There, I saw people walking their dogs, children playing, and couples flirting with one each other. Suddenly, in my head, I could remember my past. I remember that I used to play with my friends and doing dumb stuff that I could never have imagined doing now. It felt nostalgic. The couples. I remember the real reason why I stopped going outside. I was sad, depressed, because I used to have a partner as well. I immediately felt sad after seeing the couple, but I was happy for them. I wanted to leave the park early. I do not want a lot of people to see me sad. I went to the next location, the river bank. I saw that there weren't any people at all. I rested at some spot just not to think of anything and stop thinking about what had happened before. I looked at the lonely river bank, took a look at the running water. I see my sad face. I didn't want to see it, so I averted my eyes away. I looked around the place I am in, and I thought that there should be time when people should think about their mistakes and rest. It was about to go dark. I hadn't realized I'd stayed outside that long. I went home fast. I did not want to catch the night before I get home. I ate first before going to my room to think about my story. After eating, I went to my room and reevaluated what I had learned and what stories I may come up with. I came up with a story not thinking if it seemed good enough to submit. I came up with a story that I was satisfied with, a story that involved learning and understanding of the way of life. Time passed, and the time to submit it was about to come. I dressed up to go to the convention, and without thinking of what story I had, I saw a lot of people. A lot of people submit their stories. I thought they must have worked hard for their stories, but it did not make me feel down. It was my time to submit mine. I felt nervous, scared, yet proud of the story I came up with, and only the readers can judge my story, whether it's good enough or not. Time passed, and whether I passed or not is history. This is where my story ends. <laughs>